welcome to the brave, the few, the curious, <laughs> the, the heat-stricken heat people. Um, can you hear me? Is this loud enough? Testing, testing, testing. <laughs> Marius, make it easier. Make it louder. Marius, test, 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 test. Good. Thank you, Marius. You can come out now. <laughs> um, my lecture today, as you can see, is architecture in Arabia, and this goes back to the whole point I've been making that there's so much cultural diversity in this area. It is just so different from one country to another and one region in each country to each region. And I think a good way to illustrate it, this is through the architecture. I'm an architecture nut. When I get, get back from trips, usually people say, great pictures of the architecture, but what the people look like? Yeah. Oh, I was looking at the buildings. So um, I will show you some pictures of people to give you an idea who lives in these buildings. But um, I'm going to start first with just some ideas. So looking at the highlands of what is Yemen, first of all, the terrain in this area, I've mentioned it to you, is just incredible. Um, sorry about the stuff on my camera lens. But um, you can see it's just mountain peak after mountain peak looking away. And these villages, everything is terraced out because it's so very steep. It is an agricultural country on a small scale. And so you look down in these valleys and you can barely see these villages that are built on these terraces. Here's another example looking down from the highlands. The, all of these agricultural terraces and the little villages that look like they're just natural outcroppings coming out of this area. It's really, really beautiful architecture. The capital city, Sana'a, is thought to be one of the oldest continu continually habitated, inhabited cities in the world, but Damascus and a bunch of other cities claim that as well. But absolutely spectacular architecture. Remember, this city is about 8,000 feet above sea level. And so it has a very different sort of the climate. It's usually dry. It does occasionally have, have um, some rain. But as you can see, incredibly distinctive architecture. These seven, eight, nine-story houses jammed in together. Lots and lots of, <coughs> of ornamentation. And the primary building material in this area is mud brick and stone. And as we'll see, they use stone in certain areas. But this love of ornamentation, this white plaster decoration, we'll take a look at the, at the windows also. And these are done also in a particular way so the lowest floors have a very small, it's kind of a fortress mentality. So the entrance is a very small doorway in a stone wall. And there's a central staircase that actually forms the backbone of these buildings. And then at the top level are these big terraces where women can walk around and do their thing without being seen. And then usually at the top of these buildings you see a block that stands out by itself. And that is the party room. That's the men's party room. It's called the mafraj. And it's the fanciest room in the house. We'll take a look at one of those. The Yemenis have a sort of a mountain goat mentality about building. This is one of the imam's palaces at a place called Dar al Hajar, which means the rock house, pretty obviously. Incredible, oops, incredible thing. This is, uh, I believe it is late 1800s, early 1900s. But again, this mentality of kind of fortress and defensive in their buildings. So a stone house on top of the Dar al Hajar, some, and here's some Yemenis down below. Another view of a really spectacular sighting, all the ornamentation. And then nearby, you can see how they even take old storage granaries and turn them into houses and they'll plop a mafraj, a party room, on top of it. Oops. Um, these are men at that site of Dar al Hajar to give you an idea of how they look. This is actually a wedding, which is the guy, which is why the guy has flowers in his hair. But in Yemen, very, very traditional dress, men wear either a one-piece thing, it's not a dish dasha, but it's, it's close, it's called zina, and invariably they wear western sports coats over them, yeah. or, which is kind of interesting look. Um, I, the joke is always, you know, the men in women's room, the symbol, with a skirt, you know, it doesn't work in Yemen. With all, with all ah. But typically, the well-dressed man wears a zina, 
usually the mandarin collar, sometimes a little tab collar, the suit jacket, um, this big embroidered belt called hazam, and then a jambia, this curved dagger, which is obviously a symbol of man's manhood. <laughs> and uh, some sort of some sort of turban. So it's a really interesting look. And once you get used to it, it's kind of kind of natty with these sport coats over the skirts. So looking at Sanaa itself, Sanaa has a lot of different types of architecture. This is the National Museum, which is sort of luxe architecture with stone all throughout, which is unusual, and then all the decoration. And here another building in uh, Sanaa. And what you see is the damp course at the bottom. This is a big problem. Although they're at 8,000 feet, there's all sorts of architectural accommodation for the rising groundwater. So you'll see buildings with usually the first courses at least are basalt because it's more impervious to rising uh, damp and also to salt. Uh, another view. And um, these are vestiges of the old water systems in Sana'a. Um, also, you can see here, when you see these round, double round window panes, it means it's a much, much older building. Those are often alabaster window panes. They predate the use of glass in Yemen. So you get this beautiful kind of milky light through these alabaster window panes. But you can see this whole city is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, as you can imagine. And they, the Yemenis are just nutty about decorating their buildings, so they do this one is, of course, is brick, and then with brick, um, with brick ornamentation, which is then covered in whitewash. And you see these men on scaffoldings all over the city with their buckets of whitewash. But here you can see the the love of these different types. These are all stained glass windows. So when you're inside these these buildings, it's just this incredible dash of color, and in some of these round windows as well and all sorts of plants, sometimes you see animals, here are crescents for the moon, beautiful, beautiful or ornamentation. This is an example of one of those windows, and the way these are made, so here, this whole idea of, of carved stucco, the Yemenis love carved stucco, so they use it above doorways, as here, so this is actually an interior stained glass window, very often there'll be a lot of carved stucco around these niches that are like storage areas. Furniture in Yemen is completely undifferentiated, this is a part of a hotel, so forget the sofa, it's usually just these big rooms with pads around the corners that you pull the bolsters off and you sleep on them at night and you put the bolsters back on when you have guests in. But a lot of carved decoration. Here, Mafraj with uh, three Yemeni friends sitting. So here you can see, actually with these windows, it is even more complicated. Usually there's a, a stained glass window on the exterior and then a carved stucco grill on the interior. And here you can see the little shelves around the, the windows with all the starf, with all the carved stucco. A detail of that kind of window with the wood beams, sometimes whitewashed. So this is the way they make the windows. They, they lay down um, a layer of thick plaster and then carve the decoration out of that plaster while it's still slightly soft. And then they fit the pieces of stained glass onto it. Then they pour another of layer of plaster over it and carve out the decoration on the opposite side. And here we have guys delivering windows at the local window shop. The Yemenis are odd. They love having their pictures taken. It, got, it gets to the point when you're there as a tourist, you start like fake taking pictures because it's just everybody's <laughs> jumping in front of your camera. Take my picture. You know, guys with turbans and Kalashnikovs, take my picture. It's like, oh, yes. Yeah, so it's great. Great. I, I assume it's still that way, but it's pretty amazing. Very, very, very friendly people. Friendliest I've ever seen. This gives you an idea of like a street scene in Sanaa in that same city. This is the way traditional, uh, traditional women uh, dress. This is called a sitara which looks like a flowered tablecloth, which basically it is from India. And then they're, they wear a black lithma, a black scarf around the top of their head and around their head. And then, really bizarre, I couldn't get a picture from front on, of course. But then there's a piece of fabric that hangs down, which is red and white, like bullseyes with black. So it's this pattern that they look through. It's a, it makes them look classically, I mean, the description is like a bunch of moving laundry when they're walking, because it's just this, fabric moving. But again, very friendly people. Even the women who are all covered up will come up and, you know, jab at my jewelry and ask me how much I paid for it and you know, that kind of stuff. 
Um, the upper class women wear just black. The more sophisticated is called sharshoff, so it's a black elastic waist skirt with a cape and then a, then a, a hood. Sometimes with these like heart patterns and little cupid patterns and stuff, it's pretty funny. Another view of guys in Sana'a. Again, I mean, this is the sort of thing when you think, whoa, this is a scary place to go. But these people are so friendly. It is just amazing. Some of these guys, uh, it, oh, some of these guys have uh, got, which is a cafe uh, angels. It's a it's a leafy herb that they chew and store in their cheek. It gives them kind of a mild high. But it's it's a you know this is why I call it the Islamic Wild West. Here, gas station attendants. <laughs> And in some of these cities, this is the city of Menaha, just absolutely incredible, built on top of a, of a rocky outcrop. Um, some of these houses are hundreds of years old. You can see the height of these, just really spectacular. And you can wind your way through the little tiny lanes that are between these. One of my favorite photographs from that town, this really nice old gentleman who is standing there. He's got an indigo, black indigo turban on. and. Uh, it's great. These jambia, they use them sort of, you can put your worry beads over them, you can put your uh, newspaper folded up behind them, you can put the handle of a shopping bag over them. But this guy, this was this was a big moment to me in Yemen because this guy, he looked really you know, like a patriarch or something. And I walked by him and I greeted him and he, he was holding a cup of tea and he held out his cup, cup, cup of tea for me to have, which I thought, you know, in a, in a culture where the tradition is Many people say like women are, are, you know, icky. You don't get in contact with them. Here he's saying, have my tea, which I thought was really nice. Again, it's the idea of hospitality. Then we get to a different part of the country with a different style of architecture, which is as impressive. This is almost old mud brick. And Yemen is, is very, very famous for the vernacular architecture, as it's called. This mud brick architecture. This is the city of Sada in the north. Sada is a city that's now very, very unstable and basically nobody's been able to go there for years. But again, you can see this kind of citadel uh, mentality. You heard little kids looking out, waving, but really spectacular. So this, these, of course, are for extended families. So in this family, people keep on being added as, as sons or daughters get married. They keep on adding people to the family, which is why these houses are so big. This is uh, Jehana. Um, some stone, some mud brick. This is the remains of what's called a long drop toilet. The sanitary systems in Yemen, the traditional ones, are there are lavatories and there is uh, there are two little blocks you stand on and the waste, uh, the liquid waste goes out. There's a, a plastered channel through here and then it would have been plastered down here. By the time it, it's so dry here, by the time it hits the, the ground, it's basically gone. So it's actually a very clean sanitary system. It's not stinky or anything. But of course, what's happened now is UNESCO and others have come in and people want water. As they've plumbed the houses, now they've got a big problem with what you do with all the wet sewage. Other guys. Uh, very tribal. So once you got outside of the main city, men are armed. But again, very, very, very friendly. And in this area, you see they're wearing skirts and like V-neck sweaters in addition to the Zena. So different variety of stuff going on here. Then there's a wonderful style of architecture in this area called Zabur, Z-A-B-U-R. And this is not mud brick, but it's mud construction. What they're doing is they do these long layers of mud, just stack it up, and then the edges are raised to give the building stability. So they let that layer dry, they put another layer of Zabur in, let it dry, and another layer. So this is a very, very different style of mud brick architecture. And you can see the layers up here for the plastering has gone sort of bad. What they normally do with these mud brick houses is they do a layer of uh, plaster, waterproof plaster on the, on the roofs coming down the side to waterproof it for the occasional room. Am, I, am I the only one who sees Homer Simpson looking off to the road? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> no, I think it's the golden calf. Oh. <laughs> or George Washington on his back. <laughs> Sorry. It's pretty good. Or sometimes they use zabur with other materials. So here, layers of zabur, you see the upturned edges, and then uh, brick, bird brick on the top of it. 
And some of these are really spectacular. Look at this subwork where it's very, very tidy. So here they're doing mud, mud brick on the bottom, zabur on the top. I'm not sure what pre predicates the combination, but they do a lot of different combinations of material here. Little girls in the same town with a zabur building behind with all of this fabulous ornamentation. Very clean zabur. But very elegant, very, very elegant architecture. Then if you go down to the coastal plain of, of Yemen, right on the coast, it's really different. You basically get round uh, reed huts. And this is you know, the area right over from the coast of Africa. So this is the, uh, the people here are much darker complexion, much more African, and they live in this sort of architecture rather than stone. But then not too far away, you get a city. This is Zabid, one of the ancient capitals, with this extraordinary brick architecture. This is the uh, this is the, the site where uh, algebra was invented. It was in Zabid, or here a mosque at Ib, not too far away, showing different influences. So then, looking at the Marab area, remember Marab was the city of the Queen of Sheba, and what we see here is really very old old habitation. These modern houses, of course, are on a tell. So what's happened is over thousands of years, mud brick houses here have fallen down. They've just kind of leveled it off and built new mud brick. Here, classic house at Marab. And then the Najran Asir area, which is very different. This is an area where there's a lot more, a lot, a lot more rain because it's right on the edge of the mountain. So and now it's in Saudi Arabia, but there's a lot more rainfall in here. And so the architecture reflects that. Uh, they do have Zabor, like here, spectacular example. Very tall Zabors. This is one of the palaces in that area. Detail of it, with the Saudi crest there. And here you can see you know, very different clothing in this area because it's Saudi Arabia. They don't dress at all like Yemenis, nor vice versa. And also, again, this, this sort of fortress mentality, but also, of course, because of the extreme heat, this is a little bit. This is actually further inland, where they're making absolute minimum window openings to keep the heat out. Sounds like a good idea right now, doesn't it? But back to the area of Asir, where it rains a lot. Here you can even see, you know, kind of rain clouds. This is really interesting stuff. This is, they build mainly in stone, not so much in mud brick because of the water, but very, very tall houses. But then they do this style, which is so interesting. This is mud brick with quartz shingles inserted into it. And the whole function of this, here's a detail, is when the mists come in, all the fog comes in, the water condenses, oops, on the, on the shingles, on the stone quartz shingles, and then drips off that and doesn't get into the mud brick. It's a really extraordinary, very clever style of architecture. And they do it in all sorts of odd things, towers, here's fancy shingling. And then Hadramaut, this, is, this gets really interesting. Wadi Hadramaut, Hadramaut means the valley of death or the place of death because it's so remote. Uh, this is the area where Osama bin Laden's family is from. But the architecture here is just completely wacky. So, for example, this is the Al Guba Palace. Uh, lots of Victorian influence here. This is a mud brick building. Wow. And they love colors. So uh, what, what they're building from are mud bricks like this, rectangles and also circles. And they stack them up. This is a mud brick building. And so the columns are made of little biscuits, little round sections of mud brick that they stack up. So these things are completely mud brick. The real key to these is they cover them with a specific sort of waterproof plaster, which they can tint in all sorts of crazy colors. And this is a plaster pit. It's called Nura Plaster. And you see the guy, these guys all over the neighborhood and they burn the plaster and then they put it in these pits, mix it with water, and then they, with these long poles, they beat it for hours and hours and hours. This is another Nura pit. 
And that's the real key to these buildings in the Hadramaut, is this neuroplaster covering. As long as the plaster covering is intact, these buildings can last hundreds of years. So here's sort of a neo-modern 50s example. Here you can see the mud brick, which is not been covered yet. This is, co this is neuroplaster. It looks like tiling, but it's plaster that they've sectioned off and made sort of cool mid-50s mid century colors. Here's one where you can see plastered, unplastered, giving you an idea of what the structure of these buildings actually is. Because looking at this, you would think it's stone, you'd think it's fired brick, but in fact it is just mud brick. This is pretty incredible, and this is the, Se the Sultan's uh, Palace in Sehun. It is a mud brick building built exactly in that same way. All of this, even this is mud brick. All of this railing is mud brick that's been covered in plaster. This is the al -Kaf Palace. The al -Kaf family is a big family in Wadi Hadramat that has a lot of uh, business in uh, Java. And so you see a lot of, lot of uh, Indonesian influence. But again, all of this is mud brick. There's not a piece of stone in this building. And here's one to give you an idea of what it looks like before it's coated, again with that same kind of decoration. Then another place, again in Hadramaut, that is extraordinary is Shibam, the Manhattan of the desert. And this is on many people's bucket list, I'll put it that way. Uh, you can see why they call it Manhattan of the desert. These are old mud brick buildings. 10, 12, 15 stories tall, very tightly positioned. And again, a key here is the, is the plaster. Here you can see some plastered, some not plastered, but really a density like Manhattan. It's kind of a weird city because it's you, we walk through and it's there's not a, the streets are very narrow of course to keep the sun off them because it's a very hot area but it's full of uh, goats kind of hard to walk around. In fact, there's some goats. But here you can see the remains of plastering on these really tall buildings. This is what the women look like in Wadi Hadramaut, the famous witches of Hadramaut. Uh, they wear these very tall straw hats for protection from the sun. Uh, these are the, the ladies who work in the fields in Hadrona. Again, very famous. If you're interested in this, come come to me. There's a couple really fabulous travel travelers' accounts. Freya Stark, the Southern Gates of Arabia. Aden, or Aden, which of course was the British protectorate. And you get what you'd expect in a former British protectorate. This is, you know, good old classic stone architecture, very Victorian. This is the National Museum in Aden. And then, again, this influence from the Far East. This is a minaret in Aden that has a lot of Indonesian influence to it. And then we were just in, in Oman. We're still off the coast of Oman. And as I mentioned, the, the country is full of forts, again, because this issue of the Imam and the Sultan, uh, but also the tribal nature, because all of these forts are also centers for the local um, judiciary, the Majlis. This is Bahla, which I've heard since I took this photograph has been completely restored. Niswa, Barca, Barca Fort right on the coast, uh, Nachal. Now some of these towers are lookouts, but also a lot of these have to do with drying dates. They have uh, date drying floors in a lot of these big towers. It's, uh, it's like ridges on the floor, you put the dates and then the date li liquor um, runs off into troughs. Um, Nachal. Of course, beautiful um, sites over the hill, over the surrounding landscape. Muscat, the capital. I've shown you this picture before with the Portuguese forts on either side, Chalali, Mirani. And this is, Muscat itself is a very small city because it's in a small depression. It's surrounded by, uh, by hills, which was the whole idea to make it very tough for anybody to get there. And uh, as we saw before, this is, this is Kabus Modern. This is his palace in downtown Muscat, the Qasr al Alam. And, and uh, I've shown you this also, another piece of Qaboos modern. The, this is the Qaboos mosque in Muscat. And we saw this. This is the Qaboos mosque in Salala. When was this built? Does anybody remember? 2007. 2007, okay. And remember how spectacular this is? You know, really over the top, the chandeliers. Um, the woodworking, and even the ablution room, the place where you go wash yourself, was like, looked like a palace, yeah. 
So thank you for your patience and the heat and just a little, little view of the architectural wonders of this part of the world. Any, any questions? Yeah. Oh. see in Dubai in the Emirates it looks like the Omani dress but it's not it's a different cut it's usually a little bit fuller they, they may not have the, the tassel but if they do it's going to be longer um, they wear the red and white or the black and white checked kafea they don't wear the Omani headdress that's what, what is an immediate tip off because it's different Um, the the um, the stained glass ones are fixed, but below there are always smaller windows that open, like double windows with little with little uh, shutters. So yes, there's a lot of air circulation through through the buildings, but the, the stained glass ones are fixed. They're they're usually at the top. All, all the fanning, it's kind of hard to get. Off. I'm trying to envision a 15-story mud brick building in terms of how thick the wall has to be to support. 15 floors. How, how thick is a, is a mud brick wall that has to support 15 floors? Really thick. Um, at the bottom, I'm guessing, if like an eight story, or like a six story building, it's probably going to be nine, nine feet wide, something like that. And the, the bottom floor, which is, is, of course, the least area because of the width of the walls, traditionally that's used for, for animals. Because even in the city, they'd bring the animals in and they'd stable them in the lower part of the house. The, the real trick for the stability of these houses is the staircase because there's one central staircase that goes up that is really massive and the rest of the walls are hung off that. So yes, the, the walls certainly get thinner as they go up and there's a lot of loss of floor space in the lower areas. Well, thank you for your attention and let's go get some air. <laughs>